Having car problems? Well, with Rhoda, getting them fixed is as easy as ordering takeout. They'll come pick up your car for free, do any repair or maintenance needed, and return it right to your driveway. They'll even give you a complimentary video inspection of your car so you can see what needs to be done. Perfect for those of us that maybe aren't so car savvy. Book your appointment online at roda.com. And lucky for you, CityCast listeners get a 20% discount on any service for up to $100 off. Just use the code CityCast20. Hey, it's executive producer Priyanka Tilve. A few months ago, when the news site DCist abruptly shut down, it was a real shock, both to journalists, but also to everyone in the city who consumes local news. This was an outlet people liked and trusted. They had beat reporters covering important sectors like crime, housing, city council, transportation. At CityCast DC, too, we were bummed to lose this treasure trove of reporting. So we were intrigued by the rumors that a bunch of former DCist employees were starting up their own homegrown thing. And after some digging, we can confirm it's true. Natalie Delgadillo and Abby Higgins are two of the founders. And today on CityCast DC, they're sitting down with our host, Michael Schaefer, to give us the exclusive details on what their news organization is, how they're going to survive when DCist couldn't, and when you can start following their work. Today is Tuesday, July 16th, and here's what DC is talking about. Hey, Abby. Hi, how's it going? Good. Hey, Natalie. Hi, nice to be here. Uh, So when DC is closed, where you guys had both worked, uh, we did a lot of coverage of that and talking about the sort of future of uh, media that's focused on this place where we live and work and play. And you all are planning to launch uh, a new organization. Uh, Why are you doing that? Great question. Obviously, it's a really difficult time for local news and for news and media in general. But we were really devastated when DCist was shuttered. We felt like we still had so much good work to do and that the work that we were doing was providing a real service to people who live in DC and in the surrounding area. So yeah, we just felt like we weren't finished. And since DCist was shut down, we heard such a big outcry from so many people who were saying things like, you know, I was using DCS stories to complete my academic research, or DCS was how I learned what restaurants I wanted to go to or what I wanted to do this weekend. And we just really saw that there's still a hole there. I myself, as a DCA resident, have been missing it over the last several months, thinking like, you know, I really wish there was a DCS story up about the election, for example, the primary in June, or I wish that there were DCS stories filling me in on, you know, whatever, like what I want to do this weekend. So I myself have really noticed the gap just as a, as a reader and an audience member. So, Can you unpack that a little bit? Because, sure. you know, you could say like, listen, there is no shortage of coverage of restaurants, of all the things in the world. Totally. Uh, and uh, there were uh, there was coverage of the election. But what you're describing is this sort of more textural thing, right? That this was your and a certain number of people's kind of particular connection, maybe the tone of voice it used or the the insights it had or whatever. Can you, what is it that's missing now? What's the hole that, that you want to fill? Yeah, that's exactly right. I do think that it has to do with, in part, DCist's tone and that sort of irreverence that the site brought to a lot of the stories that it published. But beyond that, I think it was about story selection, you know, the particular stories that DCS tackled. We tackled, you know, deaths at the DC jail. We were really the only outlet that was covering comprehensively how many people were dying in the DC jail a couple of years ago. We tackled gun violence in a very particular way. I think that part of it is, yeah, a textual thing and a point of view thing. And then, you know, I think that there's just a dearth of local news in general. There's not enough of it. So some of it is not about like, oh, nobody else is doing a good job. It's really just that there aren't enough outlets 
to be able to cover comprehensively what we really need covered in the city, whether that's things like transportation, gun violence, as I mentioned, education, I think is a space where we could really be doing a lot more coverage. Yeah, I think what we really believe is that D.C. needs a thriving local media scene, and that means that stories should be covered by more than one outlet. D.C. has a lot of great media, but it doesn't have enough local media. And we know that when local media reduces, people vote less, civic engagement decreases, there's less accountability for corporations and for politicians. And we feel like there are a lot of really important gaps that need to be filled in terms of D.C.'s affordability crisis, like why things as basic as housing and transportation are increasingly out of reach for the city's residents. Um, We really want to do a lot of service journalism and explainers, things that make it easier to live in D.C. How do you apply for paid family leave or for housing vouchers? And we want to do a lot of accountability reporting, too, holding bad actors to account. And I think, as Natalie said, something that DCS was really loved for was what we fondly called curiosity coverage, right? Quirks and culture and the things that make us really proud to be DC residents. Those things are getting covered, but they're not getting covered enough. And we've seen consistently people bemoan the loss of that kind of coverage from DCS. And we really want to help bring that back. David, thanks for chatting with me. So like you and I both have cars in the DC metro area and sometimes they're great, but sometimes they can be a hassle. And I heard you had car issues, man. Yes, my car like me is old and falling apart. (laughs) And so I wanted to get it fixed. But one of the truly unpleasant tasks I find in the world is getting your car fixed because you have to take it usually somewhere extremely distant, extremely inconvenient, arrange some alternate form of transportation. And so I heard about Rota, rota rota.com. And I went on the rota.com website And they will come and pick your car up, take it from you, and then do the work and bring it back to you. And so I made an appointment on Roto, which was easy as pie, beautiful user interface um, for the work that I wanted done. The valet showed up at around 10 o'clock at my house as exactly on time. Very easy. Just handed him my keys. He drove off with my car. About an hour later, April called me. She said, here are some things that we found with your car in addition to what you want to do. She sent me videos that Michael... Wait, that's incredible. Yeah, yeah. I'm not a car nerd, so I like want to know the nitty gritty of what's happening because I, I don't know stuff. A million percent. They sent me this video. Of, there was a particular belt that was had broken and they sent me a video of it. And they sent me a list of sort of here are the things that were recommended. Here are the things that seemed urgent to fix. And I could choose what I wanted to fix and sent that back to them, which took me like three minutes. Michael, the technician, fixed it. They then texted me and said, oh, your car's on the way back. My car was back in front of my house at 2.30. I'd given it to them at 10. It was back in front of my house that afternoon. Also, note, the valet did a much better job parking in front of my house than I do. (laughs) Don't they always? So much closer to the curb. And it was an incredibly pleasant, super easy experience. And they were very trustworthy. They were clear about what they were going to fix. And it was incredibly convenient. Yeah. So this like seems like a dream. Uh, I have used them before, but it's been a bit. Would you use them again for something like this? I would use Rhoda again in a second. I would use Rhoda. And they have a discount for us too, for CityCast listeners. So if you go to Rhoda.com, they have the discount code CityCast20 and you get 20% off. Sweet. Uh, Plots. David, thank you so much for talking with me. Again, CityCast listeners, you get 20% off off any Rhoda service up to $100 using the code CityCast20. So go to Rhoda.com. That's R-O-D-A dot com to book your appointment. Let's be real. Lawsuits are not fun. But with Paulson & Nace, at least they're a little easier. Paulson & Nace is a D.C. law firm in every sense of the word. It was founded here in 1979. Partner Chris Nace is a local who cares deeply about the D.C. community, even serving on the board of the local branch of the Living Classrooms Foundation in his free time. Nace and his associates Samantha Peters and Maya Perry handle medical malpractice, wrongful death, and other complex injury cases. And they don't just settle every case. They'll go to court. They'll fight for you. Paulson and Nace has even been recognized as one of U.S. News' best law firms. So if you have been hurt or lost a loved one because of someone else's mistake or negligence, call Paulson and Nace for a no-obligation consultation 
visit www.paulsonandnace.com. That's P-A-U-L-S-O-N-A-N-D-N-A-C-E.com. Or call 202-463-1999. So I think what you're saying is something that it's, it'd be very hard pressed to find people who disagree with across the country. And there have been efforts in all kinds of big cities, right up the road in Baltimore. The Baltimore Banner is now the biggest news organization in that city. It has a billionaire benefactor, a lot of things like Minneapolis and stuff. There are foundations that uh, take in quite a lot of money. This is, as you know, not a cheap endeavor. I'm curious, you guys are, uh, unless I'm mistaken about your CVs, uh, neither of you have started a hedge fund or have access to tremendous amounts of capital. What is going to fund this? I mean, do you have a theory of advertising or a theory of who will fund it and how much money it'll take to cover the city in the way you think it ought to be covered? Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, we're definitely accepting applications for rich benefactors. Please get in touch if anyone's <laughs> interested in funding this venture, because we we don't have enough millionaire uh, or billionaire friends or any of them, really. Yeah. So, I mean, the first thing that we're doing is we're launching a crowdfunding campaign. We're raising, trying to raise $250,000 from our community um, to help get this operation off the ground um, and pay the journalists and editors who will, will create the news. But long term, our funding model is a, a combination of membership support and philanthropic dollars. We want to have a monthly sustaining membership program that is, you know, funded by readers and, and our community members. And we also need philanthropic dollars um, because, as you said, like an operation like this is expensive. One thing that we're really heartened by is that there has been a real change in the philanthropic landscape in recent years and in recent months where there is a real realization of what a crisis we are in is local media. And there are more and more foundations that are directing money towards local news coverage and, you know, really recognizing that the civic service that, that local news provides is an important thing for donors to be funding. All right, but if I was yeah. a billionaire benefactor which I plan to be someday soon. Fabulous. You know, my first question would be, what's the plan here? You know, the old thing you did, DCist, the station that owned it, did not believe it brought in enough attention or revenue or whatever to be sustainable. Uh, whether they were right or wrong is a different question, but, but somebody who controlled purse strings cut the purse strings. What you've said so far is, uh, you know, abuses at the prison. You've talked about coverage of, of uh, affordability crisis. We're talking about rather noble coverage that it tends not to be, no matter where it's done, tends not to be a huge driver of audience slash revenue. So, you know, what is the plan? What do you mean to cover? And is it going to be kind of noble, uh, which is fine, but probably makes the financial hill even steeper? Yeah, I, I think I would push back a little bit on this contention that, as you called it, noble coverage doesn't drive any numbers. First of all, I think what we are doing is co you know covering the issues that we see as really important in the city and that we think people really need to and want to know about. But we're also covering things that are just about the fabric of the city. What is it like to live here? Or what do you need to know? Whether that's, you know, basic things about the DC Council, whether that's, you know, here's how you can apply for unemployment if you need to. Here's how to get your landlord to fix a plumbing issue in your house. Lots of service journalism ideas and also just like fun things, curiosities. As Abby mentioned, I do think those, in my experience, are drivers of audience. That was a really huge driver of eyeballs at DCist. To your point about, you know, people cutting DCist's purse string or the people holding the, the purse strings at DCist, you know, decided to close the operation down. I don't think that DCist really was given the resources that it needed to succeed. Part of that was DCist's membership program. There was a moment in its earliest years at WMU where it had an independent membership program that was growing and that was becoming successful. And when the pandemic happened and our membership coordinator ended up leaving, um, they never replaced that membership coordinator. And the sort of momentum that we had for DCS membership floundered and did not get any investment over the ensuing years. One thing I'll also add is that something that makes us different is that we're a worker-led outlet. And that makes us a leaner, meaner, scrappier organization. We've seen outlets across the country lay journalists and, and editors and other workers off while also having 
pretty bloated executive salaries at the top. So we have a crisis in media because there is not enough funding for journalism, but we also have a crisis because the money that exists is inequitably distributed. Um, so we also think that we can produce journalism in a more effective and fiscally responsible way. Have you talked with people at the Banner or MinPost or any of the other startups like that? Yeah, we've talked to a lot of different uh, worker-led startups across the country. And um, Hellgate is another example in New York, which is a, a worker-owned outlet who has given us some advice um, and whose story we're really inspired by. I was actually going to say something similar, which is another sort of way to push back on this idea that nobody wants to fund operations that are doing this kind of coverage. Or the That's not what I said. Uh, I, I, I think uh, plenty of people do. It tends to be philanthropic, uh, yeah. not capitalist. There is a sort of thriving ecosystem sure. of foundation funded outlets across the country. What this ecosystem is working towards is trying to find ways of being sustainable. In which case, I think we're saying similar things, but there are publications who have managed to do something like this really successfully. You pointed to the Baltimore banner yourself. Abby mentioned Hellgate. There are also other things like LA Public Press, um, Block Club in Chicago. There are lots of examples, particularly in recent years, that I think show that there's a pivot happening, both for journalists who are really interested in driving the direction of their own work and their own organizations, but also for audiences who I think have started to come to the realization that local news is really important and adds to their lives and that they are be willing to pay for it. So why do this instead of just like starting a sub stack where you cover the same stuff? Well, I mean, I don't think a sub stack is cool. I follow lots of sub stacks. I have nothing against sub stack, but mm -hmm. I don't think that it's going to provide the same kind of breadth of coverage to just like be by myself sort of blogging and then have no editor and put it up. That's not really what we're trying to do. We're trying to be sort of a professional news gathering operation. Mm -hmm. And the other thing which we haven't mentioned is that a core part of our model is going to be seeking input from the community and really co-creating part of this vision and the direction of our coverage with people who live in DC and who care about DC. So I don't think a Substack would really lend itself to the kind of community engagement and audience engagement that we're really trying to do, nor to the kind of like comprehensive equitable coverage we're trying to create. Let me ask you, so I was editor of Washington City Paper. When City Paper was threatened with going out of business and when it ultimately stopped printing, there was a lot of, you know, rending of garments of, oh, you know, they spoke truth to power and they invested in long form narrative writing and they did investigative stuff, so all true. We also, you know, had a sex column and did goofy headlines just because we could and waged yeah. like unnecessarily mean jihads against minor public figures in DC and acted snarky because it was funny and because we could. And, you know, I think a lot of times when a place goes away and is, uh, there's efforts to resuscitate it, they resuscitate the good stuff, the high minded stuff. But it's hard to get a charity, it's hard to get a philanthropy to fund snarky headlines and sex columns and goofy wars against minor local music scenesters or just being mean or whatever. But the bond between media outlet and audience is tied up in the high and the low together. Yes. So as you solicit money from foundations, as you seek community involvement, how do you get around that? How do you preserve the kind of weirdness that created your bond in the first place with people who followed you? I think one thing in terms of funding is having a mix of funders, right? And that's part of why we aim to have philanthropic funding and also member funding. We want to have member funding because it is another revenue stream, which is important in such a challenging financial landscape. But we also want to do it because it makes us accountable to readers and it makes us accountable to what they want to hear and drives conversation and what makes people laugh. In addition to what Abby said, which I totally agree with, I think that the answer to how you're able to maintain that relationship with your audience and also do these really important stories is that you need the resources to do that. If you have enough reporters and your reporters are not overworked and your reporters have the room and the ability to be creative and the encouragement to be creative and experimental and funny and snarky, you will naturally create an environment and a culture in your newsroom where 
those stories are rising to the top and you're able to do something that's really unique and original and that's driving an original relationship with your audience. But if your reporters are totally strapped, barely able to cover the basics, working 60 hours a week and extremely underpaid, it's going to be really hard to really sustain a model where you can do both of those things, like cover the snarky things and the funny things and the irreverent things, and also cover things about the DC council or the DC jail or whatever it is that you want to focus on. So part of this is, I guess, sort of circular, but we need a sustainable model in order to be able to do both. You mentioned about sort of community input and feedback and direction and stuff. That's sort of a double-edged sword. People don't often want to read things that make them uncomfortable. We've just last year we had this huge run up in crime in DC. That for a long time there was a lot of people who thought like, don't do those stories. You're relying on the police. They're stirring up hysteria, etc. Um, and it, you know, I, I think there was a lot of people who sort of resented. They perceived it as like elites aren't telling are telling us to not believe what we see in front of our eyes, or our neighbors are getting carjacked, or whatever. And you know, I've always sort of thought like an editor or a you know newsroom leader has to be. You know, you, you have to be relentlessly curious about the world, but you kind of have to be impervious to what they want because you just have to tell the truth as you see it. How do you marry those two things? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I think it makes me think about a couple of things. One, I think, is how we tell difficult stories. I don't think that the difficult stories that we tell as journalists always have the right context to help readers understand the, the background of the stories that we're reporting on. I think it's also really important to us as an outlet to have what's called service journalism and explainer journalism and news that people can use. So I think it's less news that is telling people what to think about an outlet and more news helping people live better lives in their city. I mean, to be clear, when we say we're seeking community input, what we are saying is we want to create a real relationship with our readers so that we know what they want and what they're saying and what they're concerned about. That doesn't mean we're going to do literally everything everybody tells us to do. We are still exercising our journalistic instincts, our professional discernment in deciding what to cover and how to cover it. And we're being very transparent with our audience about how we're doing that and why we're choosing to cover what we're choosing to cover. So it is really about seeking input and creating a reciprocal relationship, but it's not about getting rid of our journalistic integrity or discernment. So you talked about trying to raise $250,000, which doesn't really go that far if you're talking about livable salaries in DC. How many people do you imagine having? Right now we're six people. And are you guys like all in? Is this full time for everybody? Not at the moment, certainly. But the plan is to have most people at, at least half time. Part of this depends on how successful our fundraising is, right? But six co-founders will hopefully be either full-time or close to full-time if we have a successful fundraiser. The $250,000, we are also planning and need to have met by philanthropy. So $500,000 is really our initial fundraising goal, which believe will sustain us for about a year of operation. Fundraising is going to become easier as soon as we can start creating journalism and as soon as we can start publishing. So this initial fundraiser is a runway for us to prove what we can do as a team. All right. So tell me about the format. So to start with, we will be a weekly newsletter that includes one to two stories, deep dives that help you understand a major issue impacting your life in DC. And we'll also have smaller stories covering quirks, culture, curiosities that define life in DC. Also things like, you know, events guides, things to do this weekend. We're planning eventually to scale that up uh, and it will be more than a weekly newsletter when we have the resources to do that. You know, the newsletter is really the medium, like one medium where we're hoping to get things out. But part of what we're doing with the Um, community engagement aspect of this publication is searching for original and new ways to distribute our content, whether that means distributing physical copies of stories um, to people who might not see us online or creating WhatsApp distribution channels. So the newsletter is one medium, but we're really working on different ways to get things out to people. And when can I start reading? We are planning to begin publishing by the fall but we will maybe do it sooner if we get enough money to, you know, really get this thing going. And you had a poll to name the thing. We sure did. Yeah, we had a poll to name it, which almost a thousand people responded to in just a couple days with 
extraordinary levels of enthusiasm that is part of what convinced us that this idea had legs. The winning name was the 51st, which is the name we selected. It was a name that people were really excited by and one that we were really inspired by a team. It's obviously a nod to DC statehood, but it's also more than that. It's about representation and self-determination writ large. We're a worker-led outlet, so the workers are collectively creating the journalism that we produce and collectively running the news organization. Organization. Um, and we also are building an outlet that we want readers to feel represented by and that readers have a direct voice in. Awesome. All right. Thank you guys for being here. Thanks, Michael. Thanks so much for having us. That's all for today here on CityCast DC. You heard Natalie and Abby talk about the importance of membership programs, and we have one too here at CityCast. You can sign up at membership.citycast.fm, and for as little as $8 a month, you can get ad-free listening, first dibs on live events, exclusive members-only content. We're actually going to be dropping a special members-only episode this Thursday. It's the Q&A from the live taping that we did on Saturday with the DC Office of Planning. If you want access to that, sign up before Thursday. Again, membership.citycast.fm, and thank you so much for your support. We'll be back tomorrow with more news from around the city. Bye. 